We're very pleased to see many of you who are here this afternoon. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the speaker. And uh, since nobody introduced me, I'll introduce myself. I'm Norman Jacobson from the Department of Animal Science. Uh, sometimes these things go through to three or four people before we get down to the speaker, but it's simpler in the case here this afternoon. Our speaker was born in Lehigh, Iowa. Uh, I don't know whether all of you know where that is. It's probably no cardinal sin if you don't, but it's not very far from Ames, about 50 miles, I would say, 45, something like that, up toward Fort Dodge. Uh, he spent a good bit of his early life, various parts of Iowa, in and around Anamosa. His Bachelor of Arts degree was from Cornell College, Doctor of Science degree, then from Johns Hopkins, and an MD degree from Johns Hopkins. Subsequent to that, he was involved in various ventures uh, at a number of different places. The Peter Bent Brigham Hospital in Boston, the New England Deaconess Hospital in Boston, Harvard School of Pu Public Health, the U.S. Public Health <coughs> Service, and various other positions. He has had numerous professional assignments. He is a member of a dozen or more societies, which I shall not relate here. He has published extensively 130 or so publications in the scientific literature. Dr. Mann's research interests are in cardiovascular disease, particularly atherosclerosis, in human nutrition, and medical ethics. He has studied pygmies and Maasai in Africa, Eskimos in Alaska, and Americans in America, and probably a lot more that I'm not uh, informed about at the moment. He is uh, Associate Professor of Biochemistry at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, also Associate Professor of Medicine at the same university. He's a career investigator with the National Heart and Lung Institute. I think that you will find that Dr. Mann is articulate and candid. He does not hesitate to disagree if his convictions dictate. In fact, he might be disappointed if there wasn't some little disagreement on some of the things that he has to say. It's a very distinct pleasure then for me to introduce to you Dr. George Mann, who will speak to us on the politics of food and feeding. Dr. Mann. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson, Mr. Stevens, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a, a rather unusual experience for me to come back to Iowa, and it is come back because I have not been here for at least 20 years, and to come so close to where I began, which is a little town up the road, Lehigh. I, uh, when I was asked by uh, uh, these young men to uh, speak to you, I gave them several options. And uh, the one they selected uh, was one of the options. Uh, it's not necessarily my strong suit, but I, as you'll see, I do have some rather uh, definite opinions about this matter of uh, the politics of foods and feeding. I come to a campus like this uh, just a little wary because I've been on other campuses, <laughs> including Berkeley, and I know how wild these students can be at times. And so I don't know for sure <clears throat> how safe it is here. I sit on the health committee of my university, which is, I suppose, by your standards, rather square. We're a conservative bunch down there, but we were shaken up uh, a couple of weeks ago when a delegation of male students came to our committee meeting and proposed, and I believe seriously, that we should put birth control pills in the vending machines and cigarettes on prescription. Now, <laughs> if you think about that for a little bit, uh, it does make some sense, you know, but uh, that's a far cry from uh, 
Cornell College and the campus life that I was introduced to uh, many years ago. Still, uh, it's refreshing for me to come here and find Yankee students examining our social and political problems in a setting of orderly lecture halls and reasoned debate. We are not impotent or helpless in this society if we channel our criticisms and proposals through proper means. The first requirement is to be well informed. My remarks here are intended to make some biomedical input to your discussions. If, as Alexander Pope remarked, the proper study of mankind is man, then we can agree at once that science and agriculture have no meaning for us except as they affect man. Medicine is the biology of man, biochemistry his mechanism. The contributions of biochemistry and of medicine to the nutritional welfare of man are rather different. Biochemistry grew out of the European organic and analytical chemistry toward the end of the last century. Until then, nutritional knowledge was essentially empirical. People ate and fed those things which were available, which tasted good, and which caused no obvious trouble. In the interval of 1912 to last week, when the total synthesis of vitamin B12 was announced in science, the trace nutrients were discovered, their mechanisms were largely explained, and their therapeutic advantages were exploited. That was a remarkable 60 years for nutritional biochemistry. But over the same time, the pharmaceutical houses and the food merchants were making this information a business bonanza. Vitamin sales are second only to antibiotics among pharmaceuticals, and the food industry is a $140 billion a year operation. Food takes a sixth of our income. My thesis today is that foods and nutrients have become pawns for these sales promoters, and the public is often their victim. That nutrition science has often been perverted for selfish interests, and the public health suffers. <coughs> the nutritional biochemists were long preoccupied with measuring nutrient requirement in the way that you are concerned with mileage you get for your gasoline. This curiosity, coupled with the legalistic need for criteria of adequacy of food intake, led to the development of tables of requirement. Those recommended dietary allowances, as they are called, have had profound effects on the nutritional scene. First, let us consider how they are accomplished. Remember that the tables of nutrient requirement are deduced in Washington by a committee, the Food and Nutrition Board which operates under the auspices of the National Research Council. The Food Nutrition Board is, in fact, financed with money from the food industry, and about half its membership is composed of representatives of industry. Despite its outward appearance, the Food and Nutrition Board is not an, an unencumbered body. Furthermore, its membership has been dominated for 20 years by a small coterie of perennial members who rotate through the chairmanship and who are, by their behavior, accessible to industry's wants and needs. The derivation of the recommended dietary allowances. Now, if we could have the first slide, is an interesting exercise in arithmetic. Can, are the lights right for you to see these? I think if you can see this, you can see them all. They'll get better as we go along, I think. The calculation of protein requirement shown here is an interesting example of this arithmetic. And what it's showing is that from numerous biological studies of human beings, we know that the minimal body loss of nitrogen on a protein-free diet amounts to 3.2 milligrams per basal daily kilocalorie. Well, then the arithmetic is shown. We multiply by 6.25 to convert that to protein. We take an average basal calorie expenditure of 1750, multiply by 20, divide by 100, and we get it in terms of 35 grams of protein as our estimated requirement daily. But then, because the variation between, individ between individuals is considerable, a coefficient of variation of 0.15, this is added in times two, giving us a generous allowance to account for all people, presumably, giving now 45 grams of protein per day. 
And then we'd make another calculation allowing for the fact that most proteins are only about 70% absorbed, and so we correct for that. And this is how we come to this figure, which in round numbers amounts to, I'm kind of making a mess of this, one gram of protein per kilogram of body weight. The point I want to emphasize here, there's a large margin of safety built in here, and we know quite well that there are far more people in the world today who are living and in fairly good health, in fact, on only 25 to 30 grams of protein per day, so that this allowance is over generous. Now, this generosity has at least four important consequences. It whips up sales for nutrients and special foods by the threat of a high requirement. It makes the results of nutritional surveys of nutrient intake look ominous by setting the reference standards high. It discourages the solution of many feeding problems by making the goal, these goals, seem an impossible dream. It contributes to the problem of toxicity by overdose of some of the toxic nutrients, A and D notably. The medical input into these food health problems is somewhat different. Physicians are poor nutritionists. They receive little training in nutrition science. They receive much more in such esoteric ventures as enzymology. Physicians tend to relegate nutrition to dietitians, scullery maids, and housewives. <laughs> they do use the science in a curious pharmaceutical and witchery way. They know that many patients believe that what they eat influences health. The doctors know that many patients expect to be put on some restrictive or aversive diet, and so they accommodate them. People believe that what they eat influences their health. You've heard the story about the young man, maybe even from Iowa, who made a lot of money in New York and looked about and found a hobby farm down in Virginia and stalked it with expensive cattle. And then he went out to Kansas City and he paid $10,000 for a bull. And he sent the bull back to the farm. But after a couple of weeks, the farm manager called him in New York and he said, Sir, that expensive bull, something wrong. He's not doing his thing. So the owner said, Well, call a vet. Maybe he knows how to fix him. So a couple of weeks went by and the farm manager called again and he said, well, sir, everything's fine. The bull's got all the heifers bred. We're in great shape. And the owner said, well, that's great. How did he do it? Well, the manager said, I don't know, but he gave that bull these great big pills. Really? What do you suppose in those pills? Well, I don't know, sir, but they taste like peppermint. <laughs> Doctors often prescribe idiotic diets, vitamin pills. They inject vitamin B12, vitamin elixirs, because they are expected to, because it is profitable. And the drug houses encourage them in this practice. The doctors doubt that they do any harm. But that freedom from harm is a deception. Patients may not be physically harmed or drop dead sooner or later from this practice, but the harm done is considerable. It makes nutrition science party to a fraud. It is quackery of the most flagrant kind. And yet, there are serious and prevalent medical problems which are nutritional in origin and which are not recognized or managed as such. The most prevalent cardiovascular disease in the U.S. is hypertension. And yet, only about 11% of the 25 million affected persons are effectively treated. This slide indicates the results from Stamler's study in Chicago, which shows after surveying 23,000 employed persons, they found 2,725 with high blood pressure. 59% had no knowledge of this, even though the majority of them had been to their doctors, so they said. 41% said yes, they knew they had high blood pressure, but 40% of those 41% were not receiving any treatment. Another 33% were receiving a treatment and it wasn't working. They still had high blood pressure. Only 25% of the 40% were 
were getting effective treatment that had lowered their blood pressure. Now, excessive intake of sodium may have a causal role in this disorder. Until recently, the baby food manufacturers were overloading their product with salt, partly to satisfy the mother's perverted taste, but mostly because baby food is sold by weight and salt is cheap. When I pro objected publicly to this, the medical director of Gerber Products, a man named Robert A. Stewart, director of research, complained to the chancellor of my university about me. He wanted me silenced. Well, it didn't work. With time and continued pressure, the salt is now largely out of baby food, but it's still in your food, and one of eight of you is hypertensive, and only one in 10 of those is effectively treated. Another example of nutritional misadventure is alcoholism. There are eight to 10 million alcoholics in the United States. The disorder causes half our 50,000 fatal traffic accidents each year. It is the principal cause of cirrhosis of the liver, the, which is the fourth cause of death in adult men, and yet the booze business is unfettered. There is no nutritional cirrhosis, as many doctors still believe. The real culprit is ethanol. Many physicians suppose that good diet and supplementary, supplementary vitamins will prevent cirrhosis. It will not. This slide I show you because it shows, interestingly, I think, how the prevalence of deaths from cirrhosis of the liver in four countries, France, U.S., Canada, England, and Wales, have varied since 1900 through 1960. Notice how the war diminished deaths from cirrhosis in Paris because wine became unavailable to the French in those times, how it was diminished by the Volstead Act in 1920 but has steadily increased since, how it was diminished by World War I in Canada, probably because they found it more profitable to send their booze here than to drink it themselves, and how it's been diminished in the UK, especially since World War II, where they have tried to make a systematic effort to diminish alcohol intake by narrowing, by diminishing the open hours for the pubs and increasing at a ferocious rate the tax levy that's made on liquor. Well, it is past time, I think, for us to call a spade a spade and to face the truth about the evils of alcohol and the futility of vitamin or nutritional protection against its injurious effects. Over-the-counter vitamins are a billion-dollar business. The Food and Drug Administration in 1972, last month, proposed to put all preparations and special foods with over 400 international units of D and over 10,000 international units of A on prescription only. Screams of anguish have arisen from the pharmaceutical business. They argue that this will work a hardship on the patients with malabsorption who need special foods enriched with high A and D, that the regulation will prevent the development of new special foods. In my opinion, this proposal of the FDA is a good one. Indeed, I think all vitamin preparations should be on prescription, not to enrich doctors who write prescriptions, but because it would mean a means of diminishing the waste of unnecessary and sometimes dangerous vitamin pill popping. The Food and Drug Administration acted acted on A and B, I think that's fine, on A and B because these vitamins are toxic in overdose. A new syndrome was described. I feel sure I could invent a better hook for a microphone than that, but <laughs> was described by Williams in Australia in the 1950s. And it was soon shown to be caused by an excessive intake of vitamin D by pregnant women. Williams syndrome, illustrated here, is mental deficiency 
elfin facies, supravalvular aortic stenosis, and hypercalcemia. It can be reduced in most of its forms in rabbits with excessive vitamin D. It has almost disappeared in the UK since the government there restricted the enrichment levels of D in foods. Williams syndrome illustrates a common complication with enrichment schemes. The food manufacturers become involved in competitive horsepower races. They use enrichment level to sell, and the consumer, consumer can soon obtain his recommended dietary allowance from each of several foods available to him. If, in addition, he pops vitamin pills, he may be in trouble. The saddest chapter in the saga of the physician as a nutritionist concerns obesity. For 20 years, the drug houses have promoted amphetamines as a drug for controlling appetite. It does not. More important, amphetamine is a dangerous, addicting drug, a big item among the street people, the upper which complements the downer. Sweden, the UK, France, Denmark have all banned amphetamines as dangerous drugs shortly after World War II, but not the United States. The sales were enormous. Using fat people as a front for this illicit drug, the New England Journal of Medicine piously editorialized about the evils of speed in 1970, but continued hypocritically to carry advertisements for them in 1971. In 1972, at last, the Food and Drug Administration finally took these dangerous drugs away from physicians. How are these nutritional matters of the public health regulated? There are three agencies in Washington which have important roles. The Food and Drug Administration in HEW, the Federal Trade Commission of the Department of Commerce, and a strange rubber stamper branch of the National Research Council called the Food Protection Committee. It is well named, this last, because it protects food, not people. The Food and Drug Administration has three mandates, to establish and survey the identity of foods, to publish and supervise statements of policy on food preparation and sales, and to stabilize the quality of food. In effect, all of these functions are accomplished by the control of food labeling. The Food and Drug Administration does not concern itself with foods containing more than 2% meat. That's a job of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The Food and Drug Administration does not regulate milk. That is done by state and municipal ordinance. The Food and Drug Administration does not regulate food advertising. That is a function of Federal Trade Commission. The federal regulation of food merchandising is thus highly fractured for both historical and political reasons that we need not examine here. The Food Protection Committee of the National Research Council was formed in 1950 at the request of the food industry. It is supported by grants from food and packaging industries. The FPC has regularly supported industry's position, for example, in opposition to the Delaney Clause, which prohibits the addition to food of any substance known in any amount to cause cancer in any animal. The trouble is that the FPC, supported by the food industry, is heavily loaded with industry men. Five of the nine men on the panel force on food additive safety, for example, were industry men. The FPC is a thinly disguised industry lobby riding on the National Research Council front. It protects food, not people. We need a People Protection Committee of the National Academy. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has, an important, has been an important force in the national applied nutrition scene for several decades. The Direct Distribution Program, or Family Food Commodity Distribution Program, was established in the USDA in 1935. In 1969, President Nixon was proposing to replace it with a stamp distribution plan, and in 1970, he talked of replacing it with a family assistance plan. But in fact, the food distribution program continues. 
It provides food for three and a half million Americans, but it is fundamentally, I think, a bad program because it distributes the wrong food in the wrong places with an awkward system. It represents a basic conflict of interest because the USDA is commissioned to look after the welfare of farmers, not to feed our poor or our children. Feeding programs should be based on nutritional needs, not on food surpluses. In 1972, the federal budget provided $4.2 billion for farm subsidies and support, and that's twice the amount budgeted for family food programs. Under these kinds of pressures of health needs, the administration has proposed to transfer the food pro stamp program from the USDA, but not the commodity program because, as the USDA people say, quote, these commodity programs are intended to balance the agricultural economy. They serve a different constituency than that concerned with health and nutrition, end quote. And that's candid indeed. The third criticism of the stamp and commodity program of USDA is that they are operated to suit the convenience of the bureaucracy and not the needs or dignity of the recipients. The distribution center in Ithaca, New York, had a large Snoopy poster behind the distributor's desk. The poster read, I love mankind, it's people I can't stand. Now try to imagine the reaction of the recipient to this setting. These circumstances all suggest that the nation's feeding problems would go better if they were assigned to health, education, and welfare, who could be the ombudsman of the poor and leave the USDA to its proper concern with the farmer and his commodities. I was surprised, but pleased to hear a representative of Sec Secretary Butts say in San Juan in December in a scientific meeting that the USDA would phase out of both the commodity and the stamp distribution programs by the end of 1973. I hope this was an accurate statement and that the responsibility for aiding the feeding of the 20 million needy persons in the U.S. is shifted to an efficient and effective management, which I presume will be the HEW. Our present dilemma, speaking for the citizenry, is to find intelligent and healthful choices from a deluge of conflicting information about food. The ironical food problem of our culture is to choose the right foods. The ancient problem of finding enough food has been replaced by abundance. This requires education. Now, who does the nutrition education? When we were children, nutrition education was done by parents around a family table. The immediate and extended family coached us, coaxed us with what we were offered and by their examples. These methods are disappearing. Two-fifths of U.S. meals are now eaten away from home, and over half are prepared outside the home. Many urban youngsters have rarely eaten a sit-down meal and never with a knowledgeable elder at hand. The prepared foods are laden with complex chemical additives. Their very identity has become obscure. The supermarket has 3,500 items. The labels might as well be in Urdu. Packages are in a wild assortment of sizes and weights. Confusion is rampant. But one heavy force is dramatically apparent. The media sell food with an insistent, persuasive, hard pressure. Watch Saturday morning television. Watch the sponsors of the national news programs. These selling industries and their impact on us and our children are enormous. This nutritional education is part of what George Gerbener calls our hidden curriculum. I hope that you will read his essay called Teacher's Image and the Hidden Curriculum in the winter issue 7273 of the American Scholar. The media cultivate and lead large heterogeneous parts of our population. They commonly lead for selfish purpose. Teachers and schools have lost their monopoly of children as the public dispensers of information. 
our cultural climate is dominated by the incessant pressures of the mass media. This is the hidden curriculum, a device which exists to serve its originators and not the welfare of the people. The food industry would like us to see these efforts as philanthropic. They overwhelm us with their cleverness. Like the man who went on a tour to Japan and being a little deaf, he came back with a new hearing aid. And when his friends saw him, he said, yes, it's a dandy, and it only costs 19 cents. And they were astonished and said, how could a hearing aid only cost 19 cents? Well, he said, you see, it's just an earpiece and a wire that I put inside my shirt, but when my friends see that, they all raise their voices and I can hear them fine. <laughs> the food industry claims to have, Industry is dominated by such agencies as the Food Protection Committee, the Food and Nutrition Board, the Nutrition Foundation. The latter of New York claims to have donated $10 million for research in the 30 years of its, of its existence. But recall that the food industry is a $140 billion a year operation, so that in 30 years, $10 million is a minuscule share for philanthropy. Food advertising costs passed the one billion per year level in 1961. Professor Michael Latham of Cornell University proposed in a hearing before a committee of, on a, a, a committee on commerce of the U.S. Senate in 1972 that we ought to consider a Radio Free America program to relieve the plight of our brainwashed children. One half our children are estimated to watch Saturday morning television. In 1970, three food companies spent $42 million on advertising for breakfast cereals alone. Now consider the nutritional value of these highly touted breakfast cereals. This slide taken from Latham's calculations compares on the left, you see, white bread as a source of wheat with shredded wheat, and then corn grits with corn flakes and rice parboiled with puffed rice. Well now, if you look particularly at the numbers I've outlined, you can see that the more native form of the cereal is almost always superior nutritionally. And if you look at the last column, you see that by and large, shredded wheat costs twice as much as white bread. Cornflakes are twice as expensive as corn grits. Puffed rice is five times as expensive as parboiled rice. Getting particularly at the numbers I've outlined, you can see that the more native form of the cereal is almost always superior nutritionally. And if you look at the last column, you see that by and large, shredded wheat costs twice as much as white bread. Cornflakes are twice as expensive as corn grits. Puffed rice is five times as expensive as parboiled rice. You're getting less for your money. You're buying convenience packaging, and you're buying Madison Avenue, which comes rather high. The next slide, another view. How much protein do you get for a dollar in these various cereals? If you could focus that, or can I? Yeah, I can. Here's the amount of protein for a dollar in 1970. On the left, common breakfast cereals. Raisin Bran, 95. Kellogg's product 19, 46 grams of protein for a dollar. Average of those, 67 grams of protein.
per dollar. On the right, some common unprocessed foods, navy beans through white bread, average for a dollar 274 grams of protein. These processed foods are a bad buy, but they're the ones the media sell to you and your children. And while we're about this, there are probably some home economists who think they're pretty good at marketing. Would you have, did you know that lamb leg is the expensive way to buy meat? <coughs> Here on the left, on your right, the cost of protein in terms of 100 gram quantities, whether you buy it, the, the good buy or oven ready boilers, you see, the expensive protein is lamb leg. This is related to waste. Now the dilemma we are in is this, as a people, we know how to feed human beings and we have the materials, but we don't do this very well. The population, that is you, not me, is often duped and misled with this hidden curriculum, which has replaced the school and the family, for the most part, in nutrition education. The food industry maintains a clever facade in the federal agencies and in academia, where they pose as philanthropists and do-gooders while gulling the public. How can this be resolved? Before, before we turn to solutions, consider three other, what I should call, miscarriages of science, nutrition, and health. These involve the diet heart problem, child nutrition and intellect, and obesity. Let's start with obesity because, whoops, I got that one in the wrong place. <clears throat> well, never mind. In 1950, a cogent hypothesis was raised to explain the epidemic of coronary disease in Western man. Because coronary disease was associated with a high diet high in fat, Keyes, Kinsell, Ahrens, and others proposed that diet fat was the cause. In particular, it is contended that saturated animal fat is the cause, an argument endorsed by the American Heart Association and, of course, accepted with enthusiasm by the then stagnant vegetable oil food industry. Polyunsaturated oils became a crusade. And a classical example, I think, of the error of getting hypothesis confused with demonstration. The trouble is that polyunsaturated diets don't do much for hypercholesteremia, and they don't do anything good for coronary heart disease. This slide shows the kinds of diets which most of you now consume on the left in terms of total fat, saturated, polyunsaturated, cholesterol, and on the right, the relative changes that have been proposed by these proponents. Uh, to prevent coronary disease. Now, let's look to see what happens when a diet such as that schematized on the right has been fed. Here's Laren's study from Norway where 412 men in treated and controlled groups were given such a diet for five years. Laren said, this seems to prove that the diet is effective. I need a pointer here. But I ask you to consider three kinds of diagnoses. First, angina pectoris, which is a very soft diagnosis. One of you could describe the symptoms of, of angina pectoris and defy me or any physician to deny that you have it. The diet seemed to diminish that. You see what I'm building up to? Observer bias. Myocardial infarction, a harder diagnosis, but still one that there could be judgmental errors made. Sudden death. 300 years ago, John Grant, the first epidemiologist, coined a dictum, sudden death hath no fellow. You can't hardly mistake it. Sudden death, there were 16 in the control group, 22 in the treated, some treatment. <laughs> Here's the study from Helsinki, just published. Eight years of study by Maitinen and others, supported by our National Heart and Lung Institute. Maitinen said, this proves to us that 
that diet, like I showed you on the second slide back, does in fact diminish coronary heart disease. Here are age-adjusted death rates. Coronary disease, his diagnosis, 7 versus 14. In the women, 5 versus 8. But now I'll move across. This is cerebrovascular, other cardiovascular. Then look at malignancies. Then look at all diseases. But look at the last column all causes of death. Now, if you were a patient and were being put on a diet, I don't know whether you ought to quibble about what you die of. Am I going to die as a result of this? Here's the result of this pretty horrible diet, you know. Death rates are the same. I don't think Mike has interpreted this properly. I don't think this diet is good for much. And yet that's the kind of evidence that's used to buck up this <coughs> argument that polyunsaturated, low-fat, low-cholesterol diets are, are going to save us all. You can see that even medical scientists are not immune to the hidden curriculum. Now a second medical misadventure <coughs> deals with obesity. At the turn of the century, pictures will get better now, at the turn of the century, the insurance industry, oh, before I leave the polyunsaturated diets, curiously, in the Los Angeles study, where a similar diet was fed to institutionalized men for eight years, there was an excess of cancer in the treated group, 32 versus 17, statistically significant some treatment. But now back to obesity. At the turn of the century, whoops, now you recognize Rubens' three graces. That's Mrs. Rubens on the right. Obviously Rubens <coughs> would agree with me that too much thinness is not necessarily good. But at the turn of the century, the insurance industry, casting about for health predictors to help them place their bets on our lives, settled on blood pressure and obesity. They were batting 500. Blood pressure does influence health, but obesity, at least obesity of moderate proportions, has little effect. But a great segment of the food industry crept into this matter, peddling low-calorie foods. And the pharmaceutical industry came on strong with the dangerous but profitable amphetamines. A segment of the clothing industry crept in, selling clothing to suit a twiggy figure. This is another form of desirable obesity, a fat-tailed sheep. Another hidden curriculum was created, tormenting the plump, rewarding the skinny, gulling them all. And doctors trotted along like sheepdogs, <coughs> starving and scolding and pilling for profit, while they knew full well they were curing more cancer than they were obesity. This is a fat rump sheep. You agriculturists will know all about those sheep. Ordinary obesity is not a, th this is a Hottentot girl. This is called steatopygia. She's got her fat in just the right place, you see, if you live in a hot place. She's got some extra rations there. Ordinary obesity is not a threat to health. Indeed, it may be life-saving. This chart shows on the left the frequency distribution of obesity measured by relative weight in an American population, and the curve toward the right is the mortality ratio of a similar population. The point it makes is, it's only the persons that are more than 25 percent above desirable weight who have an, in, an appreciably increased risk. It's a very small proportion of the total population, and not as many would have you believe who are selling diet right colas and spandex yarn, that it involves everybody who's from here up. These people have no important increase of risk.
Diet pills help the drug houses and the doctors, but they really don't help patients. Fat people are being strung out, as the youngsters say. The prevention and treatment of obesity <coughs> is energy expenditure. You read that while I talk to you. Energy expenditure, exercise, and work. And work has some other advantages because these people might get something useful done. The final nutrition health gambit I would like you to consider is a very current one. I'm changing the subject while you're looking at these last two subjects, slides. What I shall call the nutrition intellect hypothesis. It can be shown, here's how to lose weight if you insist, it can be shown that the body systems develop at different times post-conception. The brain and nervous system comes on early, between the fourth intrauterine and the 18th postnatal months. It has been proposed that nutritional deprivation during this period will inevitably retard and damage intellectual development. Now you can understand why this notion is attractive to many. The idea that social deprivation and malnutrition in early life are the explanations for all subsequent inadequacies and failures. But there are some difficulties. For obvious reasons, most of the studies of this hypothesis have been with subhuman species, which have quite different developmental timetables and are difficult to evaluate intellectually. I am impressed with the catch-up capability of arrested human development. For example, as reported lately, boys born during the famine in Western Holland of 1944 have performed as well 20 years later as did the better fed control boys from East Holland. And yet, this argument is a powerful one to encourage us to feed babies well so that full genetic potential can be reached, that is to manage nurture so that nature can be fully expressed. But I caution you not to expect that the best perinatal nutrition is going to solve all our problems of subpar performance and behavior. Now, I have discussed briefly <coughs> some errors of omission and some errors of commission in our diet health management. Of these, I think the most serious is our abandonment of nutrition education to the food industry and the media they use. This is now almost unchecked. In my scale of failures, I would say the next important error is the hesitancy we have shown in supporting our regulatory agencies, the FDA and the FTC, in putting a rein on what the sellers can do and say about their products. This is being corrected. I hope that each of you will do all he can to support Dr. Charles Edwards, the able commissioner of the FDA. He's getting the job done. I only wish he could move a little faster. The correction of the pseudo-scientific nutritional therapy practiced by so many of our physicians is the hardest of all to correct. This will take an educated, informed public because the AMA is very deep in its trenches. I know because I'm down there with them. To summarize, <coughs> my position on the current diet health situation is this. Our dilemma is one of choice of food, not the ancient one of finding subsistence. Intelligent choice requires education of the population and regulation of the vendors. The nutrition education of people has gone by default from the home and the school to the media, and they often act on selfish motives behind a facade of philanthropy and scientific rectitude. Physicians and scientists are frequently pawns of these and their own promotional schemes. They exert little leadership. These things must be done. We must restore health education to the schools, and we've got to begin by teaching the teachers the elements of food and health. We must regulate the advertising of foods. It is now a competitive jungle. We must improve and extend food labeling, and as you perhaps know, this is just beginning to come about. We must place all trace nutrient supplements on prescription. We must resolve the conflict of interest in the USDA by getting the food distribution programs into the hands of HEW. And I think to get the elements of nutrition science into the physician's action, we've got to get some more nutrition questions into his board examinations. 
Finally, in closing, in this university campus setting, which is bound to be one of the hotbeds of food fadism, I want to show you a slide that deals with this subject. Now, <coughs> Dr. Curtis Prout has recently surveyed the Harvard Radcliffe campus, found about 3% of the college students there were on fad or bizarre self-imposed diets. Why do they do this? I think there are five reasons for fadism. One, the hard sell, and many of you are victims of that. Two, religious reasons, philosophical reasons, the Seventh-day Adventists, for example. Three, one that you might not have thought much about but very real. When the physician says to the patient or his family, it's a hopeless case, we can't help him, sorry about that. This is an unacceptable decision for most people. Read John Gunther's little book, Death Has No Death Be Not Proud. Read Hilda Brook in the Journal of the American Dietetic Association, volume 57, page 316, The Allure of Cults. Why do intelligent, informed, educated people turn to these bizarre and fattest diets? Well, this is one reason, what I should call medical abandonment. Other people there because of ignorance, not stupidity, ignorance, a failure of nutrition education. The current reason, which I think explains much of the fadism on the college campus, is this fifth one, the fear of technology, the concern that the food technologists collectively are doing bad things to our food, adding or subtracting. They can't be trusted. They're acting on selfish interests. Therefore, I've got to go back to eating wheat germ, alfalfa, and organic uh, fertile eggs or some such. Well. My object here has been to inform you, to encourage you to think about these food and health problems. I know from experience that some of what I've said <coughs> will not please you, maybe even will arouse you to want to do battle. I suggest, though, that you should marshal your arguments and organize your reaction to something more profitable than attacking me. Our common goal is better health through better nutrition. I uh, have a not such a choice job. I'm somewhat in the position of the little dog that seduced the porcupine, you know. I've got just about as much of this as I can stand. It, it isn't something that, uh, that one should go about uh, doing every day. But I've told you what I think about this, and I hope that your thinking would be enlarged a little from what I have said here. Thank you very much. said that uh, he'd be happy to answer some questions. I understand that uh, this room is reserved for us until 6 p.m., so there's plenty of time to ask questions if you wish. Who will ask the first? There we are. Well, he, <coughs> he refers to the uh, proposal that all diethylstubestrol ought to re be removed from animal husbandry uses. And this is based on the demonstration, which is very real, that DES in large amounts uh, damages health. And in rather <coughs> complicated ways, sometimes DES to a mother seems to have caused malignancy in offspring. Now the problem here has to do with dose, and this is very judgmental. In my opinion, we could get along quite well with DES if we didn't abuse it. It's, it's the same kind of problem we have with DDT. We need DDT in this world. I'm not sure we can make it without it. But we ought not to abuse DDT, as we have often done. 
Sometimes in India, unloading wheat from America, they had a man shoveling solid DDT into the wheat. Well, now that's nonsense. There, there are towns in Mississippi that have arrangements on the light poles, and when the lights come on at night, they start spraying DDT to keep the mosquito population down. Well, you can imagine what this does to the human exposure. The point is about both these substances, I am quite sure that all our evidence supports the notion there are tolerable levels of this and that they are both useful chemicals. And I would hope that this pendulum will, <coughs> will oscillate back and forth and pretty soon come to rest where we take best advantage of those substances rather than just saying flatly, none of it. Well, <clears throat> I said that the nutritional practices of many physicians are lamentable, that physician training in nutrition is poor. Now, the American Medical Association will rally around to defend any such criticism of the profession. They have not been very productive, it seems to me, they have done some good things more remotely than recently. Their Council on <coughs> Food and Nutrition used to be an important force. They, they have frittered that away. They're not an important force anymore. Oh, no, you are overstating it. It's not a, it's not a premeditated plot. But let's face it, the practice of medicine is uh, a, a cottage industry in this country. It's run for profit. Physicians have often misused, I'm not speaking of specific ones, but generally speaking, have often misused such things as vitamin B12 and vitamins generally as a treatment. Under the guise, as I said, that it won't hurt anybody, they expect it and, you know, making a little money in the back room. I'm sure that's going on, B12 notably, but it isn't a sinister plot. They have been aided and abetted by the pressures from the pharmaceutical industry, you see, who wants to move this product. But the answer to this has got to be from, from, from us, us consumers, who say, we, nonsense, doctor, why are you giving me B12? I'm not B12 deficient. That's what you ought to be saying. Fine. Goodbye and God bless you. That's exactly what you <laughs> ought to do. I don't know. He'll always do that, though. Yes? I got up one day and I took the induction straight to the cooling unit. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, well, not. I, I am inclined to agree with John Gardner's point of view that it's very difficult for any of us as individuals to get anything done in this area. Oh, what can you do? You can write your congressman. But I do think we need to band together. We need to have a common cause to use his organization. We need so that we can bring some muscle to bear, both on the regulatory agencies and on our, on our politicians. I, I don't have much hope that we'll get much done here acting as individuals, but I think we can get a great deal done. I think you need to support Edwards. I think he's done a fine job. He, he's at, at last acting in our common interest. He's getting a lot of lumps, uh, and there have been times when it was predicted he'd, he'd lose his job, but so far he hasn't, and I hope he doesn't. But He's really catching it from the, from the pharmaceutical industry especially, and it'll get hot for him when he, he's been more active, I think, with drugs than he has with foods. But he has good people in foods, and they're beginning to move. The new labeling scheme, you know, is coming on this year. 
his labeling scheme though isn't going to work very well because you uh, speaking the country generally aren't going to understand the new labels very well because you aren't well enough educated <coughs> you see the dilemma he's caught in a label is only a limited size what's he going to put on it well we ought to be teaching children how to read those labels they ought to know the elements of food science they don't need to be nutritional biochemists but they ought to know what this thing what this game is all about you see if you were a dictator of the united states and could handle the food education of our children everyone how would you set this up dr man well i i think as i said i'd start with the teachers uh, I, th I think we have to <coughs> teach the, the teachers health science, and there's more to it than nutrition. I'm on a, on a fitness kick for the last few years. And see, I don't think diet causes coronary disease. I think it's caused by lack of exercise and fitness. So we've done a good deal of work in this area. Now, you are reported to have a hotshot football team here. Two or three percent of your student body plays football, and the other 97 percent sits up in the stands and eats popcorn and drinks beer and hoops it up and are terribly <coughs> unfit. This is a lousy health program. Everybody ought to be main working at his fitness, not working at it, enjoying it. You're not told how to do that, and we know, I know how to tell you to do it. I can't tell you in a few minutes, but we, we know quite well how to develop fitness whether it's in a young fellow or an older fellow, and how to keep him fit. <laughs> and it's not very time consuming either. Well, this ought, to, this ought to be in the health curriculum, but it's not. Most of our high school students are not in athletic programs, or they get out there and do a few push-ups and they're told to drink so many glasses of water and sleep with their windows open. Oh, for heaven's sake, that's 1910. You so I'd start with the teachers, and we're going to have to do what the physicists did quite well after Sputnik with physics and science. You know, they developed some very imaginative curricula for the secondary schools, making pretty good analytical balances out of soda straws and, and devising little economical little kits that turned students on about science, and they learned a lot, and they, and they went on with it, you see. We need to do that in nutrition. Let's face it, nutrition, home economics and nutritional biochemistry is pretty dull going. Do you subscribe to Cooper's uh, uh, system well, of phys physical fitness no. or judging it? Well, I think the idea is right. I don't like the way he goes about it. He's a... It, Cooper is a, you know, Kenneth Cooper, aerobics. If you ever get a chance to hear him speak, he's something. You'll go out of the stadium jogging. <laughs> he, really, he really is an effective public speaker. But the system he uses, the scoring, he, even he uh, privately will say he doesn't understand it. It's so complicated. And remember that aerobics, if you tried, is pretty, pretty hard going. It was the experience he had with young military men. Pretty, pretty rugged fellows. So if you're a little old lady or a little old man or pretty unfit, you're gonna find Cooper's scheme uh, gets away from you. You can't, you can't cut it. Uh, it's unduly um, intensive in my opinion. Yes? You think I'm whipping them too hard? Well, the Department of Agriculture has been in this business since 1946, and as far as a cumbersome organization, this is up there, <laughs> is equally well. I, I'm very concerned about moving the commodity program from USDA to the agency. 
I, I recognize there is a good deal of difference of opinion, and I also recognize that we may not be helping it much to take it from one bureaucracy to another, but I think the commission of the HEW is to look after the poor, the malnourished, the helpless.